begin to speak to me about where we are as a nation and where we're going and, and, and begin to speak to me concerning what the enemy is trying to do. How many of you understand what Elvin was talking about? Demonic spirits, they are real. They are, you know, there, there was a book written back in the 70s. Uh, uh, Satan is alive and well on the earth. Well, I, I, you know, I want you to understand that's true. And it's, it's more true today than it was even then. Well, I don't know that, that it's more. It, the manifestation of it is here greater than it was then. Uh, and we should not be shocked by that. Because the Word of God says that, that uh, men are going to get wickeder and wickeder, you know. So that uh, it, wickedness is going to increase. Oh, I'm going to stop <laughs> for just a second. Uh, because we were planning on the Ladies Teen Challenge being here today, we made two big old crop pots full of chili. If you like chili, I'd like to invite you to help me eat some of it after church because I don't want two big old crock pots of chili. I, I, I usually do chili about once a year. <laughs> so uh, just to invite you to uh, uh, partake of that with us. Looking at 1 Timothy chapter 1, or 2 Timothy, I'm sorry, chapter 1, the Spirit of the Lord began to speak to me this week, and he began to say to me that, certain things were going to begin to happen that, and that they were already beginning to happen in this nation. And, and he, he spoke to me and said that the spirit of fear was going to increase greatly in this nation. And, and I don't know if you've been noticing the last two weeks, but the who, it's funny that... Elvin said who, <laughs> but the who, which is, I'm talking about the World Health Organization, is trying to scare us all to death with their proclamation of what's going to happen with this new variant of this pandemic. And uh, the, the doctor that discovered it in, uh, in South Africa keeps telling the news media and everybody, it's not that serious. People don't get seriously sick. It is more contagious, which is a natural mutation of, vir uh, of uh, viruses. They, they keep mutating and changing, and every time they change, they get weaker. They may be more contagious, and they generally are, but they will be weaker. And so this, we've done had... This will be the third round uh, of, uh, of uh, this virus that's going around. So uh, if, if, the, uh, if the original one was so serious, then we got to Delta, and it, it hasn't taken near as many people's lives as they were, were talking like it's going to. And now we have this uh, Omicron, but... Have you noticed that the World Health Organization, the CDC, and our government is pushing fear at us? And the Bible says that in the last days that men's hearts are going to fail them for seeing the things that are coming up on the earth. In other words, they are going to be living in fear. Now, I don't know about you, I don't want to live in fear. Whenever I was young, I used to have a lot of worries and fears. What I found out is about 95% of what you worry about and that you have fears about don't ever happen. And that it's a matter, fear only comes as a matter of, of, uh, of unbelief. You say, well, I, I'm, I'm a Christian, I don't have unbelief. Well, 
I, I beg to differ with you. We all have areas of unbelief. Okay, you know, you, you, you want, if you want to test that, if you want to test that, just get cancer. What happens the minute the doctor tells you you have cancer? Fear. Oh, my goodness. I wonder if this is going to be the end, you know? And, and, we, and they tell you that with, with cancer, over 50% of the battle against cancer is living a positive lifestyle, not allowing fear to take over. And I believe that we're living in a day, as Elvis said, things are going to get worse as far as the economy, as far. But should we be worrying about the economy? No. My God shall supply all of your needs according to His riches in Christ Jesus. I don't know how He's going to do it. You say, well, Brother John, what if there's no jobs? Well... You know what? God might want you to start a business. In 2008, when the economy crashed in this country, there was more believers started small businesses and succeeded at them than any other period of time in this country because they heard the Holy Spirit speak to them to start a business and God blessed them beyond what they had had on their job. Isaac had that opportunity. He's living down there in Canaan, and he's, uh, you know, enjoying it, and all of a sudden here comes a famine upon the land, and, and Isaac's thinking, okay, I hear that Egypt don't have this drought going on. I'm thinking I might go down to Egypt and live for a short span down there where there's plenty of food. And the Lord spoke to him and said, stay in the land, plant, and take care of the land, and I'll take care of you. And it said, the Bible says that God gave him a hundred, in that year, God gave him a hundred percent increase. Why? Because he heard the Lord, and he obeyed the Lord. Okay? It's key. It's key. I, I, I'm, I'm not, not trying to beat a, a drum. I'm just telling you that it's key. So, look at Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7. For God has not given us a spirit of fear. Of fear and tim timidity. But he has given to us power, love, and self-discipline. Power, love, and self-discipline. Uh, the King James says that uh, he has not given us spirit of fear, but of power and love and of a sound mind. I kind of like that sound mind. Because you know what happens when people get in fear? They lose their mind. Just, you know, I'm not trying to be ugly, but it, that's what happens. When you, get, when you get really fearful, you lose your mind. You can't think straight. You can't figure out what to do. You can't, you, you, you can't uh, believe that there's any good going to come out of this situation. You, you, you look at the situation and you try to figure it out. And the more you try to figure it out, the more hopeless it gets. And the deeper you get in fear. So instead of moving in fear, we must move in faith. And the writer Paul tells Timothy, he said, God hasn't given you that. The definition of, uh, of power is force, literally or figuratively. Pacific, specifically, miraculous power. 
miraculous power. The book of Daniel says, and, and how many of you understand that a lot of Daniel was written concerning last day events? Because the Word of God says, God speaks to Daniel and he said, I'm going to show you what will fall to your people in the last times. Well, if it's going to fall to his people in the last times, which we are spirit, part of that spiritual Israel, come on, the church is the spiritual Israel, both Jew and Gentile. So therefore, if, it, if he's saying that it's going to fall to his people, that includes us. And he says there that the wicked, uh, wickedness is going to get greater and greater, and, and that, but he says this, but, I like buts. Not that way. That didn't sound good, did it? For our people that, our family that's online, I'm sorry, that did not sound good. But the word but is a conjunction. It literally means that you must go back and find out what preceded, was said preceding it. Because what was said preceding it was important. And so he says there, he says that, yes, this is going to happen in the world. Wickedness is going to get greater and greater and stronger and stronger. But they that do know their God shall be strong and do exploits. So, Paul says that this power that he's talking about that God has given us instead of fear, that this power is miraculous. It's a force that is miraculous. And, and how many of you would like to see a few miraculous things happen today? God is looking for a people that will allow him to do the miraculous through him. And he's not looking for big names. The day of big name ministries is over. We're coming into the body ministry where that every believer that believes in the name of Jesus Christ is going to be ministering to people. The reason, one of the reasons that that's so critical and crucial is that because of the times in which we live in, many people are not knowing how to cope with the things that are going on. If there was ever a time that believers need to be strong and self-controlled, I like that word, self-controlled, if there was ever a time that we need to be strong in faith and have self-control so that we're not shaking with fear in front of the unbelievers of this world who are looking for answers, it's today. Our response, every time they come out with a new variant, our response should be, thank you, Jesus, there is a new power coming to the body of Christ. You're going to reveal your, uh, your glory through your body. Look at, uh, let me go a little farther with this. So it said, uh, by imp usually by implication, uh, specifically miraculous power, and usually by implication, Application, a miracle itself. It's the ability, the abundance of meaning and mighty deed worker of, the, uh, of miracle power, strength, and violent mighty work. And the word violent, they're not talking about uh, cruelty. It's talking about uh, uh, Jesus said that the kingdom of God suffereth violent and the violent take it by force. It's time 
for the church of Jesus Christ and the people of Jesus Christ to get up and stand up on their two feet and to begin to reach out and take hold of the promises of God and don't let go of them. We have got to quit allowing the enemy to convince us that it's not for us. That, that we're not worthy of it, that we, we don't meet all of the qualifications. I'm telling you, if you have Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, you are qualified. These signs shall follow those that believe. It didn't say these signs shall follow the preacher. It didn't say these signs shall follow the fivefold minister. It didn't say these signs shall follow the elders of the church. It didn't say these signs shall follow the staff of the church. It said these signs shall follow them to believe running from the least to the greatest. And I'm telling you, the kingdom of God, he said just before he said that, that the kingdom of God was suffering violence and that the violence was taken by force. He said the least in the kingdom of God would be greater than John the Baptist. And he had just said there was none greater in the kingdom than John the Baptist. Now think about that. From the day of Noah... Or, or of Adam, until that day, Jesus standing in front of that, uh, uh, that crowd, talking about his Father's kingdom, he said, I got news for you guys. From Adam down through all of the patriarchs until now, there hasn't been anybody that measured up to John the Baptist. He is the greatest among them. Put him up against Abraham, he's greater. Put him up against uh, Isaiah, he's greater. I don't know why Jesus said that, but I'm going to tell you something. If Jesus said it, I'm going to believe it. It's true. But then he went on. He didn't just stop there and say, well, I, I, put, Jesus, I put John the Baptist at the top of the Old Testament patriarch. He's the greatest. He goes on and he says, but those who come into the kingdom of God, the least of them shall be greater than John the Baptist. See, God's not looking for superstars. If he was, he wouldn't have chose me. God's looking for vessels. He's looking for availability. The definition of love Men literally means love, love that, uh, that, that is affection or benevolent, uh, specifically in the plural form, a love feast of charity. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of love. In other words, God has given us a love feast of charity. Why do you, you say, Brother John, what is it? Well, you stop and think about everything that God has given you and I as part of the new covenant that we're living under. Greater covenant than the old covenant. The Word of God says in the book of Hebrews that it's a greater covenant than the old covenant. Under that covenant, the blood of Jesus bought, sealed the covenant of healing for you and I. It doesn't matter what kind of healing you need. It can be physical. It can be emotional. It can be mental. Whatever kind of healing you need, it is bought and paid for. And it is not just a little old thing that God gives you if you want to protect. It is a covenant. You need to understand, anything that's written in the Word of God it's not just something that God put on white pages with black letters so that you could sit down and read it. It is the covenant of God with you. God is a covenant-keeping God. He is interested in making covenant with His people and interested in keeping His covenant. So, I like this. The definition of a sound mind literally means discipline. That is self-control. Sound mind from the Greek word zozo is, is, is to save or to make safe. That is to deliver or protect literally or figuratively. 
to heal, to preserve, and to do well, and to make whole. 1 John chapter 4, verse 6 says this. We've known and believed the love of God that he has towards us. God is love. He that dwelleth in love. He that dwelleth in God. God is love. If you're dwelling in God, if you're making Him your dwelling place, He that rests underneath the shadow of the Almighty. Read Psalms uh, 91. Read it. The promises of God. If there's ever a time that we need to stand on a psalm, it's that one now. And so he says there, I will say of the Lord that he is my refuge, my fortress, my God in whom I will trust. Notice, we have known and believed the love that God hath towards us. God is love, and he that dwelleth in love, or dwelleth in God, dwelleth in God, and God in him. We have known and believed the love that God has for us, he says. You know why a lot of Christians struggle with fear? And I'm not saying this to be condemning. The reason that we struggle with fear is because we do not have a complete understanding of the love that God has towards us personally. I don't anybody here besides me ever struggled with the thought, well, you know, I know God will bless Elvin. He's a better person than I am. You know. Or I know that God will bless. And you just look at somebody and you pick them out and you measure yourself up against them and, you're, and the devil begins to convince you and bring that spirit of fear that has torment and begins to come and play with these little phrases in your mind. Yeah, but look at your life. Look at the things that you're struggling with. Look at what you've done in your past. Uh, oh, yeah, I know Jesus has forgiven you, but, uh, you know, he's not going to use you because of that. Huh? Anybody ever had the devil say that to you besides me? Fear. Fear has torment. There is nothing any more tormenting than having a little imp sit on your shoulder and tell you about all of your failures and all of your past mistakes and can try to convince you that God is not going to use you and that God is not going to bless you and that God's favor is not going to be upon you because of the past. That's fear. And it'll torment your mind day and night. The devil don't have to defeat you. He caused you to defeat yourself with your mind. And trust me, I was the world's worst. I mean, I, I, when I was young, I worried about everything. None of it happened to speak of. We have known or experienced or been very closely with as in a relationship, therefore we are convinced or totally trust and rely on the Lord of the Lord, of the love of God, protecting us and supplying for us whatever we need. That right there will drive fear out. When I get convinced that God loves me so much that it doesn't matter what I do, as long as I put it under the blood of Jesus and ask forgiveness for it, he is going to bless me. He's going to cause his favor to be upon me. He's going to anoint me. He's going to put his word in my mouth. He's going to bless me financially. He's going to bless me uh, physically. He is going to bless me because I'm his child and I am receiving 
everything, uh, everything that I have need through his love. Love is the key. Love is the key. And it's not our love. There's another scripture I want you to look at. It's in this same, same one. Our relationship with God's love causes us to operate in soundness of mind and faith instead of fear. 1 John chapter 4, verse 17. Herein is our love made perfect or complete or mature. And it's, this is where most people get off on this, and they think that they have got to ha have perfect love. That is not what he's saying. What he is saying is, herein is our understanding. Because the enemy will rob you and I if we have fear. But if we have a perfect understanding or revelation of God's love, the enemy cannot steal from us through fear. Do you, under, do you see that? That it, we, He's not talking about our love for one another. Now, in another portion of John, he talks about that. But that's not what he's talking about here. He's talking about the Father's love to us. Herein is our love made perfect. Or, or it should be his love is made, uh, our understanding of his love is made perfect or mature. That we may have boldness. When you get a revelation of how much God loves you and how that he will take care of you, that he will provide for you, that his love is upon you, that his favor is upon you, that he wants to bless you, that he wants you to walk in health, that he wants you to walk in victory. When you get a revelation of the love of God that's given you all that you have need of for life and godliness, trust me, you will have boldness. Every time the devil comes to try to convince you that you're going to mess up or going to, try to get sick or going to go broke, you can stand up in his face and you can laugh at him and say, Oh, no, I'm not. The Word of God says I'm blessed coming in and I'm blessed going out. The Word of God says I made the head and not the tail. The Word of God says that I am more than a conqueror through Christ Jesus who strengthens me. <laughs> yeah, not my problem. Devil, that dog don't hunt. That dog don't hunt. When we begin to get a perfect revelation of God's love towards us, that dog will no longer hunt. This is not saying anything about our ability to love others. This is speaking of maturing in our confidence of God's love for us. And to prove this, the rest of this verse says that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. Now, how many would agree with me that America is under judgment? Now, let me, uh, t there is a difference between wrath and judgment. Uh, and I want to make this clear. Judgment, is, literally in the Old Testament, it's translated instruction in righteousness. The book of Hebrews writes it like this. Every son that God receiveth, he does what with them? Chastises. And if you go ahead and read the rest of that scripture about chastisement there in the book of Hebrews, and he says that the reason that he chastises is so that we can become partakers of his holiness. How many of you want a little more of God's holiness? Holiness is just like any other gift that God gives you. Holiness is not something you do. It's not something you put on. It's not something you take off. It's something that you partake of. So, let me read a little farther for you. 
that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. If we're under judgment in America, and many of you raise your hand that you believe that we are, and I believe with all my heart that we are under judgment in the land of, in America. If we are in judge, under judgment, that means that God is working with America trying to bring correction to her. How many of you got a spanking or a whipping when you was a kid? My dad had this braided belt. Mm, 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 mm. That thing, it smarted. My mother, she used peach tree limb. But I tell you what, you didn't forget real soon what you got that spanking or whipping for. You, you, you decided to mind your P's and your Q's for a while. So if we are under judgment, we can either worry and get in a spirit of fear and say, what are we going to do? The pandemic is taking over pe and people dying. And, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm here. I don't think near as many people are dying from the pandemic as what's being announced. I'm sorry. I just don't. I may be wrong. And if I am wrong, I'm willing to let them show me the facts and I'll accept them. But I don't believe that because there's just too many people being connected to it. But I can get all upset and all wor worry about it. what am I going to do? What if they shut us down again and do a lockdown? They almost killed our economy totally last time. Well, what will happen this time? Well, if I have a perfect revelation of God's love towards me, my God loves me so much that he's going to take care of me in the midst of it all. I'm not anti-vaccine. I'm not anti-mask. I really don't like to wear them because if I'm having a day where my heart's out of rhythm, I can't hardly breathe with the thing on. But I'm here to tell you whether you believe in one or the other, it don't make the difference. You better put your trust in the Lord. You better understand that God loves you so much. Come on. He loves you so much, he's going to take care of you. If the writer was talking about your ability to love others, all of us are in trouble, me included. Because there are some folks that I just have a difficult time liking, let alone loving. You? Oh, come on now, don't be, uh, don't be uh, all self-righteous on me. Because there are just times that we are not able to love others perfectly. But if we don't have a proper knowledge of God's love and His provision in His love, remember, it's a feast of charity. He's giving you and I all kinds of things that we don't really deserve, that we haven't earned, but it's all a part of His love that causes Him to pour out upon us provision, Pro, uh, health, uh, wealth, uh, whatever you have need of, it all comes because you are partaking of a, his feast of love. Now let me... Okay, let's just look at the next verse please chapter 4 verse 18 there is no fear in love now that's a weird statement I've been in love since 1969 But I'm going to tell you, there's times that I've been in fear since 1969. I was in fear when she was laying in intensive care in the hospital in, 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 in uh, 
Baxter Regional Hospital in Mountain Home, Arkansas, uh, with multiple strokes. I was in fear. I've been in fear in other ish, uh, times in my life. There is no fear in love. In other words, if I have a good revelation, a perfect revelation, a complete revelation of God's love not for the world, and it includes the world, but I'm talking to you personally this morning. God sent me here to give you and to our friends online this morning. God sent me to give you a message that the world is going to shake and it's going to tremble and there's going to be hardships come. Times are going to get rough, but I'm here to announce to you, God wants you to understand that He loves you so perfectly that He's going to take care of you. So if we have that understanding of God's love towards us, notice what it does. It casts out fear. Devil comes and tries to make you worry about something, tries to make you think you're going to die of something, tries to make you think you're going to go broke and bankrupt, and all you can do is just stand there and laugh at him. Say, Devil, ha! <laughs> You're crazy. I got a word from my father. He loves me so much, he's not going to allow that to happen. Is anybody getting anything out of this? God told me that we're living in the day when there were fear is going to get greater and greater upon this earth. But he doesn't want his people to live in fear. He wants his people to live in confidence of his love towards them. Okay, so perfect love casts out fear because fear has torment. He that feareth is not made perfect or mature in love. And it's, again, it's not talking about your ability to love others. Actually, whenever you have a perfect revelation of God's love, you'll be able to love others. You know what I've been praying for us as a church as I drive around this city every day, or most every day? I've been praying that, that God will give us his heart for the lost. That we will feel for the lost what he feels. We will feel his love that he has towards them. That we'll feel the brokenness of his heart when he looks at Marshfield, Missouri, and those that are bound in drug addictions and all other types of addictions, those that are, uh, are bound with uh, 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 sickness and disease, those that are bound by sin, just sin, that we will un uh, have his heart and his understanding concerning the lost. We'll feel what he feels. I, I think that's scriptural. Jesus said, when they questioned him about why he done what he done, he said, I do it because I, my f father is doing it. He said, I only do the things that I see my father do, and I only say the things that I hear my father say. Now then, the enemy tries to use that as a cop-out for us. He offers it to us as a cop-out. But I want you to take a look at the New Testament Scripture. The book of John says that Jesus done so many things that there was not enough scrolls for it all to all be written in, and that there wasn't enough ink, if the oceans were ink, to write it. So I think... When you look at the four Gospels, you're not looking at the completeness of the ministry of Jesus. You're looking at the ones that God felt was important so that you and I
could have faith that he would do what he said he would do and that we could do what he said we could do. Jesus was busy speaking the Father's mind every day, every day, single day, and healing sick. You ever notice that how many times in the Gospels you read it says, and they brought to him the sick. They don't mention any story about the, you know, when, we, when you read a story like there's a story of blind Bartimaeus or, or, or uh, the, the beggar uh, sitting beside the road, uh, a crippled beggar, uh, when you read the story uh, of uh, the, the demonics being set free, those are bringing out details that are not in the normal transaction of D Jesus' life and ministry. For some reason, the Holy Spirit wanted those to be highlighted for you and I so that we would see the details of them. Re most of the time, it says that Jesus went into uh, the house one story says that Jesus went into Peter's house, and when evening come, multitudes came unto them, and he heals them. Doesn't give us one single fancy or elaborate story. That, no big story of a miracle, but I guarantee you there were some miracles. I guarantee you there were some healings. I guarantee you there were some deliverances. So we cannot use it as a kappa. I'm waiting on God to speak to me. Because God is speaking to us all the time. You say, I haven't heard his voice. Listen real closely. I'm telling you, he's talking. Sometimes you just need to shut up and listen. I had God uh, this, uh, this last week. I started the week doing my prayer around Marshfield, driving around the city. And this is, uh, this is on Monday. As I'm driving around the city, the Holy Spirit said, Okay, you've prayed long enough. Shut up and listen. So I started listening. And guess what? I got plumbed back to the church, and I hadn't felt like he said anything. The next day, on Tuesday, I went out, started driving around the city. I, I prayed a real short period of time, and I felt again the Holy Spirit say, be still and listen. And God began to speak to me. And he spoke to me different things concerning this, this, the rest of this year and the uh, 2022. That what he's going to do in his, in his church and in the lives of the people. I'm here to tell you that the boldness of the Holy Spirit's coming to the church because the church is going to begin to realize how much their father loves them. And that in that love, everything that they have need of has been provided for them. And then the, it, what's it say? They're going to stand up with boldness in the time of judgment. You know what they're going to be doing? They're going to be opening their mouth and speaking the word of God. They're going to be speaking into situations that have needs. And as they speak the word of God that God spoke to them and whispered to them in, in, as they listened to the Holy Spirit and got quiet before Him, they're going to speak. And when they do, they're going to see the miraculous happen. That's what's going to happen. Because when you get to the place when you know that you know that you know that you know, as Pastor Rodden used to say, that God loves you that much. And that because God loves you, he's not going to give you any bad gift. Jesus said it. He said, if you being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, and you don't, you don't give your children a, a snake if they ask for an egg, you, if you know how to do that, he says, I got news for you. How much more will your in, Father in heaven give you good gifts? That's love. I want to close with prayer. Father, today, I believe that you, I have spoken your word clearly as I, 
as I could possibly do it. I ask, Father, that you by the Holy Spirit would quicken it and make it revelation unto your people. Father, some have struggled with trying to love others perfectly so that they could uh, be free from fear. That wasn't what you were saying. You were saying that if we know you love us, that your provision and your love drives out, casts out, causes fear to leave us. Father, right now, I'm just asking that we can stand boldly in the time of judgment that is up on the face of this earth, that we can declare your love, that we can declare the provision that is in your love. Father, that we have a boldness and a confidence in this time of judgment to stand before you and to declare those things which you're going to begin to speak with clarity. I, I just bind the spirit of fear that has come to try to destroy your people, the spirit of fear that's come to try to destroy your church, O oh God. Father, this whole thing has been implemented in the gates of hell to stop your church, to shut your church down. But right now we declare in the name of Jesus that it is defeated because your word is true, your love is perfect, your love is mature, and you declared in your word that, uh, that the schemes and the plans that were laid up in the gates of hell and planned by the demonic forces of hell shall not stand against your church. Lord, I'm asking that you begin to show us in runs around these things that the devil has set in place. Right now, in the mighty name of Jesus, I ask that you begin to give us clarity, such, Lord, that we know it's your voice and that we're obedient to do it. And, Father, that as we do, we see your blessings and your provisions that you have promised through your giftings, Father, in the name of Jesus. Amen. You know, as I was, as the Lord began to speak to me about this, what was it, February 2020 that we started into this pandemic? To show you how the devil is trying to lock down, and this is what the Lord spoke to me, that the devil is trying to lock down his, the, the church but the Word of God says that the gates of hell or the plans and the schemes that are built in the gates of hell shall not prevail against His church. One of the things that was a part of the plan and the scheme of hell in this plan pandemic is to shut down pastors and Christians going into hospitals to visit people and to pray for them. I don't know if you know this. I can't get into a hospital to visit people. Uh, I think you can have two visitors a day at Mercy. One? Okay, I guess they've tightened it up. At, at, at Cox, you can only have one. And you have to name, at Cox, you have to name that person. And guess what? It's not going to be the pastor. If you want pastoral ministry to you, they will send the chaplain around to see you. Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to spout something off. I seriously doubt that those chaplains know how to walk in the power of the Holy Spirit. And so, see what the devil has done? But you know what? Our God's love is perfect, and he's going to provide a way for us through this. And it's not going to just be the pastors be able to go into ministry. It's going to be all of the people. The devil's tried to shut us down, but the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church of Jesus Christ. Understand that. Fear has no place in it. 